folks. I'm bringing the energy today. It's today in space. Ah, uh, theme song by Nick Hall. Thank you, sir. This is, as we said, today in space, our space science podcast. I'm your host, Alex Girofanos, and it's another week. It's another podcast. We were going to put out the Mars rover, Mars 2020 rover Perseverance breakdown mission, but uh, we got a little wiggle room. The mission got pushed to the end of July, and uh, I just wasn't ready yet. So we're going to work a little bit more on that, really fine-tune it, get it firing on all cylinders, and then we're going to have that out probably next week. I need about just one more week working on it. A lot is going on in my life. I hope uh, a lot of good things are happening in yours. I hope at the very least you're finding some kind of peace in the day and um, taking care of yourself. But to start this week's episode, we have to give you an update on the rocket project for 2020. So this week, actually 24 hours ago, so we're recording this on Wednesday. So uh, on Tuesday, we put out a post on our Instagram page at Today in Space Pod, which had all of the, well, had four of the more popular, basically the top four names we got from you guys on what we should name our first rocket. Because remember, um, if you guys haven't been following along, if you're just joining us, thank you. We are doing a model rocket. We are making our own model model rocket this summer. Um, Could I have said that any weirder? My mouth literally is not working. Anyways, um, we are going to make our own model rocket. We're going to 3D print it. You know, we have 3D printing here. We've been 3D printing models for the podcast. You know, we've got our um, Starship model here. We've been making models like this is the first Starhopper from SpaceX that is now a a test stand for the Starship area, which uh, uh, SN5, Starship SN5, should be doing some tests soon. I know it was going out uh, in Boca Chica for testing. They pulled out the crane recently. Um, huge, huge crane that they're, they're doing to lift these, these starships into place. Uh, but that's happening. And of course we have our crew dragon, uh, 3d print here, which we brought to Florida with us for the CRS 19 mission and showed it off. It's also a model of the same spaceship that took astronauts, Doug Hurley and Bob Bankin to the international space station on demo one. So I'm sorry, demo two. Demo one was the uh, abort mission, but um, where they aborted the spacecraft in the middle of the max Q, basically, where the, the rocket experiences the worst kind of, uh, the most forces. Um, anyways, I'm rambling here, but the rocket project, that's what we're doing. We're 3D printing it. That's what I was talking about, right? So we're 3D printing these model rockets, and we're basing them off of these that we have here. So uh, first of all, we have our first one. I'll put this one away. That's for that's for later. But we bought an Alpha Three from uh, Estes. I think I think I'm saying that right. I've actually never. I've only read it. I don't actually know how to say it, but I think it's Estes. E S T E S. They are uh, pretty well known and just model rockets. You know, this is a their Alpha Three flying model rocket kit. It's a launch set. It has a launch pad, uh, which is what we need. It has. So that's this guy here. So that's going to be our launch pad for all of our rocket launches, even the ones that we make ourselves. Um, You know, it comes with injection molded parts, nice thin plastic. Here we've got the tail end. We've got different parts of the launch pad. And of course, we have the various aspects, our parachute and the fairing. And basically where you put the motors, different things that are going to let you have that model rocket, things that we're going to replicate. But what we're going to do is we're going to try and make our first rocket just basically very, very similar to this. You know, the, the, the main, you know, body of the rocket, which, you know, I guess you could consider the first stage whenever you're talking about like a Falcon 9 coming back down. Model rockets, most of the time it's cardboard. A lot of that reason is because it's light, right? Um, and that's what makes these model rockets fly real high without you having to get some crazy motors. Um, so that's going to be one of our challenges here with our model rocket is weight since we're 3D printing it. You know, plastic is uh, inevitably heavier. You know, it's more dense and it's going to have more weight than you would have for anything cardboard related. It's essentially paper. So there's going to be some things that we're going to have to do to change it up. Um, you know, and if we look at the Falcon 9 and Dragon here, it's very, very similar. We have a cardboard first stage and second stage, but second stage doesn't deploy. 
Um, and then we've got some cool plastic parts. Here's our engines in the bottom here. And more parts of the rocket. Our parachutes. And of course, our dragon capsule up top. Uh, you know, and this model was one of the, is the first model rocket that I've ever uh, got. It was a, as a present. Um, got this back in like 2000, I think it was 12. I think I was just graduating, co or I was going to graduate college. Um, I ended up graduating 2015. But you've heard that story if you listen to this podcast. It's also a story for another time. But essentially got this rocket a long time ago and have been saving it for the right thing, uh, the right moment. And so one of the things that we're going to try and do with this rocket project is we've got all these different rockets. Our first launch is going to be launching both of these, seeing what kind of height, what kind of altitude we can reach with these. And then we're going to test our 3D printed rocket to see how well we can perform. Um, you know, we can do some math before to obviously have an idea of where it might be based on weight and based on the engines that we can put on there. Um, but it's also aerodynamics, you know, with the 3D printed part, um, there are some things we can do to make it better, but we're, I think one of the biggest things we're going to deal with here is weight. But we'll find out. Uh, one of the things we're going to do that's cool, that's going to make it interactive, is we're going to go live on, on Today in Space, uh, probably on Facebook, maybe on YouTube if we can get that set up. We're going to be designing the rocket literally live, so you guys can hang out. We, I can talk to you about the different decisions I'm making. I mean, I'm literally going to be taking a pair of calipers, going to be measuring the different aspects of the model rockets that we have already, and then making decisions based on the technology I have in front of me, which is 3D printing, right? The, the plastic parts that were made on these model rockets are injection molded, right? So there's a giant mold, they're injecting plastic, so they can get pretty, pretty thin. A lot thinner than we could probably get with 3D printing, but we can do with a lot of really cool stuff. And I think it's just a good opportunity to show you guys, like, how, if you're ever interested in how people make 3D printed parts, how do people design things? If you've never seen uh, computer uh, CAD, as they call it, or 3D design, we're going to do that. I'll answer any questions you guys have. You guys can hear the decisions I'm making. We can even, while we're going live, make decisions, and you guys can be a part of that, on which direction we go. Because there's so many different paths you can go on when you're designing something. And, you know, it's it's definitely one thing to have just sit down and do it myself. But I think it's going to be pretty cool to do it with you guys. So I'll try and be more active about when we go live so we can uh, we can talk more about it. I was thinking maybe even this weekend, honestly, it's possible. But what we got to do before we do any of that is we've got to name this sucker. So what we did this week is we sent out a post with the top four, and I was saying this before, before I went on a rant, but the top four names. And 24 hours in, we have our results so far. We're going to go through into, the, into this weekend uh, with the voting. So if you want to vote, Go to Today in Space Pod on Instagram, find any of these posts where you see the names listed, and comment to give us your vote. Let us know which name you like. Um, we're even having some runners up, runner ups as well. So if you if you want another name still, um, if you put that up there and you get enough likes, you get enough people putting that up there, uh, it's you could blow it out of the water. You could actually come a uh, full come from behind win, uh, sign in, uh, ballot, sign your own name, <laughs> and who knows? Who knows? Um, right now, the list goes in first place. The classic Rocket McRocket face has been uh, a name that's popped around for naming rockets for years and years, uh, and always seems to get uh, derailed. Uh, it never actually gets to be named a rocket, but right now, that is our top vote, and we are not taking it down. If that is what you guys want to name this rocket, we will name it Rocket Man Rocket Face, I guarantee you. So uh, next, we have Galileo. Uh, that is our number two name. And in third place, we have Shakespeare, uh, which is a nice play on words. And then runners up, we have, uh, I don't know why he wanted to say runners up. There's no S after the runner. Again, my voice, my mouth, the connection to my brain and my mouth it's not quite working. Maybe I haven't spent enough time with human beings. I've been inside too much on this lockdown. Who knows? But runner-ups, the Melvin, which is named after astronaut Leland Melvin, who I've been following for a while, and uh, he was really great to have as one of the people who were 
uh, on the broadcast for the Demo 2 mission, the Crew Dragon mission where we sent, you know, launch America. The first time we launched Americans, American astronauts into space aboard an American spacecraft and an American rocket since the space shuttle. Um, and it was great to have him there as an astronaut, as a promoter of, of STEAM. He was, he's, he's a great guy from what I've seen from the outside, what I've seen from him as an astronaut. And why not name it after one of our incredible African-American astronauts? He's one of the best. One of the others uh, sent in by Frankie Sagan, uh, at Frankie Sagan on Instagram, was the was Van Allen Rocketry, which could be the name of our rocket-building 3D printer. Who knows? That could be our, our little th- rocket manufacturer. Who knows? But I like the name. I like the name. Van Allen, of the Van Allen belts, which is obviously uh, the belt of radiation, that makes traveling space with humans uh, a little difficult. You need shielding. I mean, literally, you pass through that, uh, life is not going to survive, or it's it's going to not have a very good time surviving uh, until awful radiation sickness kills you. But that aside, we're talking about making that rocket, 3D printing it. We've got a lot of options, and I'm excited to show you guys that again. We might go li- We will go live. I'm just not sure when. If you guys have any recommendations, probably on a weekend. I'm definitely getting more busy as it is. I'm uh, starting a new adventure in my in my day world when I'm not wearing the mask of a podcaster. So it's getting busy. I have priorities. I've got to move around. So uh, we're doing this episode this week because it's just things got too busy, and I'm sure that's where kind of we're all at right now. You know, I hope I hope you're staying safe. I hope you're staying healthy. You know, both physically and mentally, because, you know, I've, I've talked about it before, but I'm definitely doing a lot of things, uh, a lot of tinkering for my own mental health, just to keep me uh, somewhat sane <laughs> uh, as we go through uh, still on lockdown, still things not completely back to normal, and not even sure if things will go back to normal. So I hope I hope you're staying busy or at the very least doing whatever you have to just to keep yourself healthy both in mind and body. Whether it's a little bit more working out, maybe it's going on some more walks, maybe it's listening to some more music or a podcast or doing something you haven't done in so long that you've been, you know, holding off. You know, there there are some silver linings to, to this stuff where um, it does give us the opportunity to do some things we haven't done in a long time. I know um, one of the things I've been doing more of is cooking and, and actually eating a little bit better, which is good. One of the things people do is, you know, watching a movie, hanging out. I've definitely watched more movies. Had You've got to have that escape, right? And one of the things I definitely recommend, a uh, space movie kind of documentary that I can offer is Spaceship Earth. Now, I, I bet you this in an Instagram post. Uh, it's on Netflix. It's a documentary on the people and the story behind, or at least part of the story, behind Biosphere 2, which was an experiment from the late 80s, early 90s, and it's mind-blowingly strange and fascinating in many, many ways. I I don't want to give too much away. Obviously, it's historical, so uh, you could just Google it, but uh, Biosphere 2, that is, but it's, it's a how long the story actually is from when this group kind of originally got together these these uh, this group of people led by uh, John Allen who weren't really engineers you know John Allen was an engineer but they were a bunch of people who were looking to do things completely differently you you could definitely call it the start of environmentalism and um that hippie culture flower childs and and what they were able to do just together you know, they were really focused on what they wanted to do. And it's very inspirational in that sense that, you know, people that, you know, they they did crazy stuff like like build, uh, they literally built a ship and rode it, you know, uh, around the world. And then from that, they took it to the next step to make this Biosphere 2 project, this biodome where you could replicate what you could do on Earth in a dome, which could then be used on another planet. And it, 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 of course, from a space perspective, this is where, you know, we're talking about humans going into space. This is, this is a huge part of where we want to go. And it's a, it's a fascinating story. It takes a turn for the worst. It takes a turn for the strange and the weird. And 
definitely if you're looking for an escape and, and for to watch something else that is actual human history and go, okay, yeah, things, things are weird and, you know, maybe make me feel like today's things aren't so bad. Like, oh yeah, we're all, we've always been crazy. We've always been a little wild. So for that, I definitely recommend it. If you're definitely looking for something different to watch, watch it. I, I highly recommend it. But it also brings up a really good point is this could be a major problem for Mars colonies, moon colonies, and just space colonies in general. You know, we've, we've followed a few other missions where they've kind of simulated having people live in the same place under the same conditions for a long time. A lot of, obviously, they've all been done on Earth. And it always gets weird. There's always a point where, uh, you know, and a lot of this is hu- is human behavior and how you interact from the environment. And we are all experiencing with this lockdown, with COVID, we're all experiencing a little bit of that weirdness that comes from being stuck in one place. And I think one of the things I've learned so much, especially with going out, you know, I've, I've kind of stayed in a lot. I've had the, the opportunity and, and, and luckily the, with the luck to, to be able to, to stay inside and restrict, obviously, the, the, the spread of things and, and, and me spreading it to other people. But masks, masks are so strange. And not being able to see someone's mouth move and all of the, you know, not, not being able to see the whole picture of the facial reactions that someone makes is strange. It's, it doesn't, you're not getting the whole picture, you know, and, and, and even though things like over Zoom and stuff like that or whatever company it is, FaceTime or whatever you're using to interact screen to screen, at least you're seeing the whole face. You're getting all that data as a human being of what that other person is about, the context of the things that they're saying. And with with a mask, you're just you're you're missing so much, even if you're face to face with somebody. So it that alone has been very strange. And we're we're not on some colony on the moon. So just imagine all the weirdness that we're facing today and, and, and the, the quick change that our all of our lives have, have been under and what it's done to us. Think about that, but then think about it in an environment where you can't leave. Like there's that's the environment and there's you're not gonna change it <laughs> once you're there. There's that weirdness, and then there's the the weirdness of who's gonna be in charge of these Mars and lunar colonies? Is it going to be a government entity? Is it going to be a private entity? Basically, like this Biosphere 2 mission, which didn't necessarily have all of the scientific input and the scientific data and peer review process and things that were put in place, uh, a marketing team. Uh, if, if you watch the, the documentary, you'll, you'll know more about that. Just to, just to be able to spin the message because uh, obviously the media spinning it a certain way or whatever way that they're choosing to, it makes you question what things you need in order to do that and in order to communicate your message properly and in order to obviously make it so that those people survive, you know, if we're going to have people live on another planet in some colony, if it's going to be sustainable, if it's going to be a place that's going to be traveled where we can go back and forth, it, it has to be done right or at least needs to be built upon and doesn't go into complete, you know, anarchy and, and get destroyed before – you could even get back there. You know, does the does the interaction with people get so bad that in the in the worst of cases, people get injured or die, you know, and, and, and you end up devolving into some craziness of, you know, some Lord of the Flies stuff, you know? That that's possible. That's possible. I mean, we're seeing it the simple task of wearing a mask has made it so that some people have freaked the out. I mean, that is, that is real. That, and that's just one thing built on top of, right? So that's like one little thing that usually wouldn't be a big thing, but because of the severity of the situation, because of the anxiety and the stress and the madness that this sudden change has done to us just on earth, imagine what those environments in a dangerous place like the moon, in space, on Mars, where Literally, the environment outside this thing that's keeping you alive, just it's it's craziness. So I highly recommend it. If you want a mind trip, 
if you want something to uh, get your mind off of something and some way to just think about what's possible and kind of be relating to. Biosphere 2, Spaceship Earth is the, is the documentary name. Go watch that. I've talked about that enough. <laughs> but it's definitely something that's a problem for the future that we need to look out for. And if anyone has any idea of where to find more information on Biosphere 2, um, that documentary was great. But I'd like to know if there's just more. Like even if it's old newspaper clippings, old, I don't know. I, I don't even know what's available. But if you do, please reach out. Today in Space Pod on Instagram and Twitter um, at El Greco, E-L-G-R-3-C-O on Twitter. Today in Space Podcast at gmail.com. Let me know. In space news, Starlink 9 was going to launch today, Wednesday, July 8th, but it got scrubbed due to poor weather. They brought the countdown to T minus one minute uh, and got some data on the rocket just to make sure that the next time that they launch, they'd be all set. That's usually one of the reasons they do that. Just good to know what the health of your rocket is right before the point where the rocket takes over. It's always good. Gives you a good idea of where it's at moving on, but we don't know when that's going to be. So if it's at a point where we can do a live stream and do a launch hangout, we will. So look out for that. But there's no launch date right now. Also, one of the other things we can talk about on this episode is, you know, it's some early stuff. It's a little uh, a little political, but not really. Uh, the only reason it's political is because it's about funding. It's about government funding being allocated for different exploration missions around the solar system. Uh, one of those missions that was funded and, and brought us a ton of value, not only scientifically, but I would say socially, uh, especially on the internet, in, in culture as well, was the mission to Pluto. Because obviously, people have learned about Pluto for years and years and years, about it being our one of our planets in our solar system, and then when it was demoted and made a dwarf planet, and... Many people got upset, and but it also created this kind of Pluto club and the New Horizons mission that flew by Pluto and gave us all that amazing uh, information and data and images and science, of course. But it changed the whole way we, that we look at Pluto. And, and really for me, I mean, obviously we, we made a song about it, Pluto the Misunderstood, so obviously it had a big influence on us. We got to go to the NASA social for the New Horizons mission before it got to Pluto while it was still in flight the early days of the podcast. Pluto is a, is this kind of system that is, is not just the planet Pluto and it has a moon, uh, Charon, but it's this whole system. There are so many different things. It's this gem in the, in the Kuiper belt that is just kind of there. It almost seems out of place. And it's amazing that we were able to see it, to have that mission. And one of these other amazing missions that could change the way we look at space and influence more people to do more and get involved in science and, and think big and think about life outside of our planet is the Europa Clipper mission. Uh, if you've heard about that before, it's because uh, the mission has been funded. They've been trying to get it ready to launch. They are ready to launch in 2024. Part of the, we were talking about politically, the funding uh, that they're looking for 2021, one of the things that you worry about when things go through funding, is, and, and this is with any kind of science, funding, and politically really any kind of thing that has funding, you worry about it getting cut, you worry about it getting too expensive, lasting too long. I mean, look, all, there's so many different programs, parts of the space program in the last decade, in the last 20 years, that have been canceled because they got too costly, started and then canceled, and then we could have spent that money on something else. And so the reason I bring up the Europa, Europa Clipper mission is because it, it had been tied for so long, and I'm no expert, so if, if, if you do know more on this, please chime in here. But from what I've seen from the outside and from keeping tabs on it, is that the Europa Clipper mission was tied to having, you know, in Congress for it to get the funding, it had to be launched on the SLS, the Space Launch System. And that made sense because NASA's making this new rocket to travel the solar system. So in order to make, you know, it, it makes sense. In order to make the Space Launch System more valuable, you make it so that all these other missions are kind of bundled in so that the funding has to go, it all it all kind of goes in one place. And maybe that was an easier way to, to sell it in Congress and to get bipartisan support so that it can get passed. But one of the things that's happened, it's the first step, it's, it's not over yet, the budget hasn't been finalized, but it looks as if, according to this article uh, by Eric Berger on ARS Technica, which I highly re recommend following Eric Berger on Twitter and just reading his stuff, he, uh, he, he's 
tapped into the industry, uh, and I, I like the way he he portrays it uh, and gives his his side of things and 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 the information that he shares. That aside, it looks like the Europa Clipper is now being able to choose whatever way it needs to go into space. Which, if you talk about the world before SpaceX was really chosen as as a, an option for NASA to use, there were so many ways that the space industry was was kind of this club that you had to get into, and it was very you had to be in, and it was very hard to get into. It was something that SpaceX has been fighting for many many years, and obviously with this with launching American astronauts again being the first to do so, uh, and and following up on their their commitment for the crew uh, commercial crew program gives them a lot of you know clout and uh, the ability to to leverage their technology because now there's a trust in it. Their their whole problem was they were new technology. How could you just let them do it? They've successfully launched humans on board. They've passed the NASA check of approval to do it. One of the other things that SpaceX brings to the table is the ability of the Falcon Heavy, which uses reused first stages. Uh, of Falcon 9s, so the the cost per booster, there's three on there, a first stage and the two side boosters. We obviously saw the first attempt, uh, the first Falcon Heavy demo launch, uh, where they launched Elon Musk's red Tesla Roadster into space uh, with Starman on board. Uh, that was exciting time, amazing things. And so the one of the options that's available for the Europa Clipper is the Falcon Heavy with a kick with a what, what, what did they describe here uh, with a with a kick stage? So basically, the Falcon Heavy is a very monetarily efficient, budget friendly rocket, but it doesn't necessarily have all the delta delta V and uh, the ability to place things into orbit as the SLS would have, which is the space launch system, the thing that NASA has been working on for a really long time. It won't be ready for that twenty twenty four time slot that the Europa Clipper mission is ready to launch. And the problem is, if the Europa Clipper mission doesn't launch in 2024, it loses its window to go to Europa, to Jupiter, to to get there on time. Uh, basically, the, the way that the orbits work, that's when they need to launch. If they don't do that in 2024, they have to put this spacecraft in storage, which costs tons of money. It's also the same problem that NASA is dealing with right now with the Mars 2020 rover. You know, they've pushed the, the mission to July 30th, I think it is, at this point, or no earlier than then. But their the end of their launch window is August 15th for this 26-month um, window that we have to launch to Mars. You know, we have to launch when Mars and Earth are at its closest, and that happens every 26 months. So if the Mars 2020 rover doesn't launch by August 15th. They got to put that puppy into storage for 26 months. And guess what? That's a ton of money. I, I was looking at some of the monies, uh, some of the information about how long it would, uh, how much it would cost. Uh, we're looking at millions, if not billions of dollars for it to be safely stored so that they can take it out after 20, you know, two years basically to, for in the case of the Mars 2020 rover to launch again and for it to be safe. Um, so obviously, it was a smart move. It would be a smart move for Congress to just say, "Hey, yeah, we don't want to pay more money later. Let's just have someone who's available do it now." Now, there's plenty of other options that are out there. I think the Delta IV Heavy from um, the United Launch Alliance may be able to do this. I think they may have to do some second stage stuff um, in order to get the 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 proper uh, delivery to orbit to get to Europa in time. But regardless, it's just an interesting look at basically what the space program has to trudge through in order to get the funding to do the things that we want to do. And it's 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 part of the game, at least right now. You know, the, one of the great things about SpaceX is they they allow for going into space to be a lot cheaper, and it sets the groundwork for the whole industry to strive for something like that because obviously they have to compete to stay alive as a business. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very interesting time. Um, we're definitely excited to see that there, that w- there's a lot of teamwork politically 
on both sides to work together, which is so rare in today's world, but they're working together, red, blue, Republican, Democrat, whatever whatever they are, they're working together to find solutions to make this stuff work. So, hey, I, I, I'm really happy to see that. That's, that's very exciting. Um, it's definitely a, a relief to see. And one of the last things that we'll talk about here is something that happened uh, with Rocket Lab. They had a failure of delivery of their mission uh, into orbit. Uh, what I want to do is just play the clip from Rocket Lab CEO Peter Beck. I have him explain it. He put this out on Twitter um, just so that we can hear it from his words, and then uh, we'll close out. To our customers, partners, and the entire Rocket Lab team, and all of our supporters out there, it's fair to say that today was a pretty tough day. During today's mission, late into the flight and after a successful liftoff, first stage burn and stage separation, we experienced an issue on the way to orbit that caused the complete loss of the vehicle and unfortunately the payloads. To our customers, we are deeply sorry for the loss of those payloads. Believe me, we feel and we share your disappointment. However, we will leave no stone unturned to figure out exactly what happened today so that we can learn from it and get back to the pad safely. Electron is one of the most frequently launched rockets in the world today, and after 12 consecutive launches to space, today's issue is a reminder that spaceflight can be very unforgiving. It's certainly a day we never wanted to experience, but one we had prepared for. Electron followed a safe re-entry trajectory within the safety corridor, causing no harm to personnel or property. We're working closely with the FAA to investigate the anomaly and identify its root cause, and correct any issues to move forward. I have to say, I'm incredibly proud of the way the teams responded with professionalism today. Already as I speak, they're combing through the data to learn and prepare for the next mission. We have many Electron launch vehicles in production, and we're ready for a rapid return to flight as soon as these, as soon as these investigations are complete, and of course all the corrective measures are in place. We look forward to getting back to the pad very soon. Thank you for everybody's support. And so, you know, Rocket Lab, if you guys don't know Rocket Lab, we've talked about them a little bit here, but they're, they're a young rocket, rocket company. They have the Electron rocket. They've been doing some really, really great things. They opened up a new launch pad here in the U.S. Uh, they were out of New Zealand originally. And they, uh, it, it's, it's something that I think every rocket company is going to go through eventually. Um, a failure, something happens, things don't go well. Sp- going into space is not... Uh, it's not very easy. Sometimes we make it seem routine. Like the last episode we were talking about how it's crazy that landing a rocket, that SpaceX has kind of almost made it seem routine, which it it, it doesn't seem routine when, when you just know a little bit about like the craziness of what they're trying to do, how big these things are, but they've done it enough times that now it just seems like normal. That's kind of what happens to the Apollo program. Oh, they went to the moon. Great. What's next? You know, but these things happen. SpaceX went through uh, anomalies where uh, they lost payload. Luckily, it didn't happen when there were humans on board. Same thing with Electron. They were just delivering payloads into orbit. So uh, we wish Rocket Lab luck figuring out what happened. You know, that happened on uh, July 4th. And on July 6th, Peter Beck tweeted that, you know, we're quickly making progress into the anomaly and the team is chasing it down with gusto. It has been incredibly humbling to see how much to see so much support and kind words. Thank you, um, and, and we wish we wish Rocket Lab and Peter Beck luck. You know, they'll, I'm sure they're going to figure out what happened, and um, they'll they'll be launching soon. But things happen, and you gotta you gotta figure out a way to make things work to get yourself back up, pick yourself back up. I mean, God, I think we're all we've all been at a point, especially recently, where we've we've hit a low. I mean, whether it's, whether it's just, you know, everything is so crazy and it, it, it weighs on you and maybe you just, uh, who knows? I mean, people have lost jobs. People have uh, had health scares. It, whatever it is, it, it's going to happen. And when it does, do what you can to get yourself out of it, build yourself up, start slow, give yourself some momentum and get back at it. I mean, it, that's, that's all, that's all you can do. That's all you can do. So uh, thank you guys for listening this week. Uh, it was kind of a last-minute podcast, throwing it together, sharing some thoughts, sharing about the Rocket Project 2020, voting for the name of our rocket. Again, 24 hours in, number one is Rocket McRocket Face. 
Number two is Galileo. And number three is Shakespeare. So go to Today in Space Pod to help us vote on those throughout the end of this week. We'll keep posting, giving you the results, where we're at, and, and that's it. I hope you have a great week. We'll be back next week, fingers crossed, with the Perseverance Mars 2020 rover mission. We're going to dive into the mission, give you some things you may not uh, – we're, we're trying to pull all some really fascinating stuff about the mission into one episode, looking for like 20 minutes to 40 minutes, something you can listen to on a drive, something that you can learn about, have a companion podcast for the mission, which hopefully should happen at the end of July here. At worst, the end of that window is August 15th, so we're looking for that launch uh, to happen and to go off smoothly so they don't have to put that rover into storage and have that mission cost way more money than it has to. We wish everyone at NASA luck putting that together, getting it to work. Best of luck. Be well. Spread love, spread science. Be well. We'll see you next time.